How many times have you found yourself standing in front of the refrigerator, tapping your foot, wondering, what do I want to eat? Are you really hungry for food? Or are you hungry for self-love, possibility, motivation? Maybe you're hungry for movement, patience, routine, abundance. These are all things that mask themselves as hunger for food. Joining me today is Dr. Adrienne Udom, and she wrote the book, literally wrote the book on how to deal with being hungry for more. So let's get carried away. Joining me today and getting carried away is Dr. Adrian Udom. How to use our hunger to reconnect with our needs, values, to create a loving relationship with ourselves is our topic. Dr. Adrian. Dr. Y, what do they call, what do your patients call you? My patients call me Dr. Udine. That's only in the office. Dr. Adrian works. Adrian works. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just glad to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I forget who connected us. Was it Liz Swadek? I always like to remember who. How, it it what? was Heather. Oh, Heather. Yes. Yeah. And you also know Deborah, uh, cause I saw you on her podcast. Yes. Shout out to Deborah Cobalt, everybody. She's Yay. got a great, Woo! great project. Love Deborah. She's a yeah. great champion for female entrepreneurs. Now she, um, Dr. Adrian, that's what I'm going to call you on this has written a book hungry for more, which I'm obsessed with loved, loved, loved. Because when you think about weight loss from the inside out, just weight loss in general, you really aren't just hungry. You're hungry for more, whether it's love, compassion, boundaries. I really, really loved this book. I know for me, after reading it, I was, I checked marked which chapters was like, yeah, I I'm, I'm hungry for boundaries. I'm hungry for self-acceptance. I'm hungry for power. So I loved the book. Bravo to you. Um, you. A lot of my listeners and entrepreneurs also have the idea of writing a book. So I want to know, like, what was your process when you were like, I'm going to, this, this needs to be a book. Like, how did, did you go into the practice knowing you were going to write a book or did it kind of evolve into that? Mm. So I must say that journaling is one of my soul foods and I write on the regular. In fact, I was seven years old and in the third grade because my parents lied and shoved me into kindergarten at age four. I was always younger than ever. So not only was I like an immigrant, I mean, I was born in California, but I was, you know, looked like an immigrant, had immigrant parents, was living in Texas, not a lot of Middle Easterns in Texas at the time. No, you know, like frizzy hair, humidity is not good for Middle Eastern, (laughs) right? I mean, it's just awful. And then on top of that, you know, I was younger than everybody else. Anyways, my teacher, Miss Lusky, gave us a journal and I haven't stopped writing since. Really love it. And that's, I think, a a tip that I'd like to give everyone, because it is such a powerful way to process your life. And I mean, I did it as a child and turned into an adult activity. But now I know that there's so much scientific data behind it, that it is so helpful for well-being to reduce ruminations, anxiety, depression. They've even done studies, Carrie, you're not going to believe this, that for people who have like rheumatoid arthritis, if you journal, your disease activity score goes down. I mean, what the hell is that? Are you serious? I swear. And I think it's because um, when you write or when you engage in any process that uh is healing, is soothing, like brings down the sympathetic nervous system, right? It it frees you up to to deal with the thing, to deal with, right? And in terms of your mind, it's the same. When you write um, and you get all the shit out, I hope I can curse because I don't curse curse on my own platforms (laughs) and on everybody else's. Um, Then it frees up your mind to really deal with the issue at hand. So use it as a spiritual practice, um, as I did. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's a thing, right? Like any other thing, as much as you love it, when you formalize it into like a job, or I want to write a book, there has to be some discipline around it, right? And there were some great books that I read that were my partners as I was reading, or as I was writing, they were like my holding my hand as I was writing. 
One of them was by uh, Pressman and it's called The War of Art. Okay. Right? Not The Art of War, but The War of Art. And one of the things he said was, one of his quotes was, you have to put your ass where your heart is, <laughs> which means you got to sit in the damn chair every day, right? Like it's not enough to be all spiritual and ooey gooey about it. At the end of the day, it's a job. You need to sit down, inspiration or not, and just do the thing. So I think everybody has a book in them. I think everybody has something to say. I mean, that's really what it means. If you have a book in you, it means that you have something to say. Sure. But the only way that you're going to get that out is by sitting down every day, promising yourself you're going to write X amount of pages or you're going to write for X amount of minutes or hours and being diligent about it and seeing what comes. The second tip I'm going to give you, and then we can move on because I could talk and talk for days, is that don't auto edit. Mm. Don't, don't start editing before you've even written the damn thing. Right. And another beautiful book by Anne Lamont, which is a great companion, is called Bird by Bird. And she has a, a expression called the shitty first draft. <laughs> Love that. And she says that you have to get that shitty first draft out. And then it's like clay. You can mold it. But if you're too busy editing yourself, then you're never going to get anything out. So put away the judgment, give yourself the time. And just do the thing and see what comes. And I'm, I get excited about this because this book wasn't only my gift, my love letter to my patients. It was so therapeutic for me. And so I imagine that for others to write about their passion, it would be therapeutic for them as well. For sure. And I love that you tell it from the perspective of it feels like you're reading a story. It's almost like I'm getting a glimpse. Every chapter was just like, oh, who are we? Oh, this is Jan. Oh, this is Brad. Oh, like I'm getting a little peek in the side of everyone's, you know, so there's kind of this voyeuristic greatness about the book and be like, and then of course there's relatability. And I think and every, of me, by the way, right. And yeah. So I, I know that a lot of people have been like, Ooh, it's so intriguing that a doctor would, but hello, like at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. We all share the same struggles and griefs and triumphs and hopes and wishes and desires. And that was the intention behind this book was to really um, express the commonality of our hungers. And honestly, it doesn't even matter if you're overweight or not. I mean, we have a, my husband and I box with this uh, former boxer once a week. He's, he's it's super fun. <laughs> he's young. He's African-American, he's fit, he's a former boxer. I mean, I wouldn't think like hungry for more than this book was for him, right? <laughs> right. He read the book and he said, I could identify with every chapter, which is like, wow, if a fit uh, boxer can identify, it really means that our hungers are universal. And in my practice, because you're catching me in my office today, I see actresses, producers, stay-at-home moms, lawyers, executives. I have a former basketball pro basketball player in my practice. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are, how successful, how much money. At the end of the day, the stories were all the same. And so I share that in the book because I think a big part of Dealing with our emotional hunger, whether it's weight or just our mental well-being, is putting away the shame. And when we recognize we're all the same, that common humanity piece makes us one step closer. Absolutely. To doing You're, that. And, you know, honestly, the book kind of gave me, anyway, uh, permission you gave me permission to be like, okay, this is why you're feeling this way. That it's okay. Uh, but you need to get out of your own way. Like you, you led us there, but then you're like, but you got to do the thing you can, you can talk all you want, but you actually have to do it. Uh, which let's just dive right into the book. First off, I love boxing. I just started going back to boxing, uh, since my knee surgery, I go to box union and, uh, there's one in Santa Monica. We should go. Oh, so fun. Put together. Uh, yeah, let's go. It's fun. It's boxing to the beat. So there's a little shout out plug for box union. So fun. Um, but when 
I was in recovery and one of your chapters is hungry for movement. Um, and you know, for everyone who doesn't know, I had knee replacement surgery, but the idea of not being able to move really, really affected my depression. I, I never thought how much I loved it more. Um, and the, in the, in the chapter, you talked about this guy who was very athletic and he would run and then he just, something happened with his knee. So I oh, really right. saw, I really saw right. myself in this guy. And then he then became in love with boxing. So for me, this chapter really spoke to me. Crazy, uh, right? Yeah. It's really well written. I have to say, um, because it's, it's relatable. My first question is, do you think this is a very American problem? the idea of being hungry for power, for boundaries, or do you think it's universal? Do you think women in China and, and France and all over the world are feeling this? Because I think it could be translated in multiple languages. It's that good of a book. But what do you, do you think this is? A, because yeah. we do have a culture that's very gluttonous, you know, and we have so much available to us. Do you think it's an American thing, this kind of idea of struggling with weight management and you know, diet culture? So I think there's a lot of questions there. I think if you're asking me, is it a uniquely American problem to have the hungers? Absolutely not. Yeah. And in fact, if you remember, there was a chapter of um, a Chinese uh, a girl who was born to a Chinese family. That's right. And within that chapter, we talked about hunger to please, right? This desire to please her parents, which was then uh, transitioned into pleasing of, you know, bosses or whatever, or hunger for perfection. I mean, that is universal, right? Like your desire to be perfect, either to please a parent once again, or please your boss or your coworkers or your sure. husband, mm -hmm. right? Um, hungry for, um, for presence, right? I mean, I think all different people who are, um, I mean, I think everyone struggles with that, right? We're all yeah. all over the place. That's a human problem. So the answer is, I, no, I think this really is universal. I think as Americans, of course, we have certain um, nuances like our striving culture, mm -hmm. right? Which is very much in this book, like our goal-oriented culture, right? Like even when I was writing this book or when I started writing it, um, People, I was like part of this mastermind that I had to drop right away because people were like, you should write five steps to weight loss or five steps to, or seven steps to. And I'm like, what five steps? Yeah. There is no five steps, people. And like, whoever is like shoving that bullshit down your throat, you got to call it out as bullshit. There is no five steps because the process of coming to terms and reckoning with your hunger is not a destination right? It's something yeah. that evolves. And I think, you know, this book is also, again, my stories from age six to present day. And I describe how, I mean, maybe I could not relate to every single patient, but I did in some way. And I showed how the, the hunger evolved, right? From when I was a child to maybe when I was a teenager to when I was a young adult to when I was a resident and breastfeeding in the call room, oh, <laughs> to, right? So hard. Yeah. To like the present day. And so, um, so again, to answer like succinctly, I think there are those unique things that what comes to mind really is our goal oriented culture and our st constant striving um, that creates a hunger that seeks to be soothed. Yeah. And we can drink, we can smoke, we can do drugs. But like I tell my patients, if you're a goody two shoes, you're going to just grab a cookie. Yeah. Or a whole box. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear Girl Scout cookies are like out again. They oh, are. Sheesh, I don't want to like throw them under the bus, but come on people. <laughs> right. Well, you were, cookies. and we're ingraining them at a very young age, <laughs> um, but damn it. Those thin mints are really good. I mean, seriously. <laughs> They're really good. So what do you think the skinny is on weight loss? Like what's, I know there's no magic potion. There's no, you know, I've can't even tell you how many diets I've tried everything from Weight Watchers to Atkins to Keto to Noom to all of it. What 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 do you, what's the magic thing? I what, mean, what, again, what is, you're you're asking me again. What are the five steps? Right? Yeah, and, and it's just 
and it doesn't exist. But I think I think I can say this. I can say this. I can say that in the moment. Okay, so we have physiologic hunger, right? And yeah. and the end of the book, the epilogue is just hunger, right? So don't starve yourself. Like when you're hungry, you're hungry. But we're not talking about that right now, right? Right. There are times when we are itching for something, right? Like, and that's what I call the hunger, right? You know, you're not hungry. You just had dinner or lunch, right? You know, you don't, you're not food hungry, but you're in the pantry, right? What is it in that moment that you're hungry for, right? Maybe um, you've been Zooming all day and you're tired and you just need respite. Maybe you would be better served uh, grabbing your journal and going outside on your porch and spending five minutes under a tree with your, you know, with your, your activity of choice, with a book. Maybe um, you've been super quarantining during this pandemic and still are, and you're hungry for connection. You're in yeah. the pantry rummaging, but what you really, that itch, what you really need is to pick up the phone and, and call your childhood BFF and say, damn it, I'm lonely right now, right? Yeah. Or maybe um, it's something very trivial, like you're sitting at your desk and your desk is cluttered and it's chaos. And that chaos is like, you can't deal right now. It's giving you anxiety. <laughs> I mean, literally, <laughs> right? I had a patient who was like, every time I sit down at my desk, I've had breakfast and then immediately I want to get up. And we realized that part of it was just like her office space was giving her anxiety because it was so cluttered. And so she couldn't deal and she was seeking to soothe. So the answer is like, ask yourself, right? What is it that you're hungry for in that moment? And so it doesn't have to necessarily be emotional eating. You know, like I think sometimes when people hear even the intro, like your intro to the book, they think, well, I don't have a problem. I'm not a perfectionist. I'm not, I'm not emotionally eating. I'm not comfort eating, right? It doesn't have to be this like melodramatic thing. It can be something very simple. And yet it's sufficient to be evoking a hunger that needs to be soothed. So can I just say one last thing? Yes, please. Yes. Is that, so, okay, fine. I've convinced you that maybe there's something else. Like, okay, now what, right? We are so busy that we don't have enough time to even notice, right? Like if the listener out there is saying, well, I don't know, is it my cluttered desk? Is it that I need connection? Is it like, it's all of the above because we all have been experiencing all of it, right? Yeah. If you slow down, if you take the time with that journal, right? If you just stop, um, it may not come to you immediately, but over time, yeah, you'll start to get the sense for like, what is giving me angst? I love that. So tell me, what what is someone feeling, experiencing or going through? And they're like, I need a Dr. Adrian in my life. What, what's like their threshold or for like, I, I need to find someone. <laughs> you know, I, I think my, the, the feedback from the book has been so heartwarming because to your point, people have found themselves there. Yeah. So I do think that the book is a great place to just open the conversation with yourself. Like if you're like, I, I'm intrigued, but I don't really know what she's talking about. I want to, I'm hungry for more. Yeah. <laughs> Read the book because I do think people will find themselves there. As a compendium to the book, I created a 30 day journaling guide. It's probably more than 30 days to be honest, because the, the daily journal, journaling prompts are so deep that I think it's going to take people time to marinate with it. Um, but those are questions that I've asked myself. Yeah. that I ask my patients to ask themselves to try and get those wheels turning in that way of figuring out what it, what is it that I'm hungry for? Mm -hmm. I and love it that. is a, a process of like kind of self-discovery. And then of course, I mean, I'm here for one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I do have a medical background. So people who, you know, maybe they're diabetics and they need to lose weight. And so there's also practical stuff that we have to address. Sure, <laughs> sure. Time, Blood pressure. Right? and yeah. Or yeah. just want some more hand-holding because not all my patients have like illnesses. 
Um, but I really give that the one-on-one -on -one support. I love that. Um, and so we're going to definitely link the book and the how to get the workbook in the show notes. So everyone who's listening, just, I know you're driving right now. Don't look right now, park and click the link, for <laughs> her website. Um, what do you think is the biggest misconception you're, when you're working with patients that they come in with, um, about either weight loss or the type of hunger they're experiencing. Like when they have that aha moment, it's like, oh, I'm not hungry. I, I actually need to set up some boundaries or, you know, wh what is that word? What's that misconception you keep saying? Um, I like, like with your question, I feel like there's, again, so many directions to go. It's like not one question. Let's get practical for a second. I think a very common misconception is the way in which we perceive the word diet. Mm. Diet really refers to what we eat. Like a cow has a diet of grass, right? I'm not comparing us to cows, but at the end of the day, a diet is a diet, a Mediterranean diet, a vegetarian diet, right? But this is very American. We associate immediately the word diet with weight loss. hundred percent. And then our mind goes into restriction. So I have to starve in order to lose weight. I have to restrict myself in order to lose weight. I have to, right? And what does restrictive thinking do? It immediately makes you wanting that thing, right? The second you tell your kid, like, your kid has a million toys, right? Your right. two-year-old has a million toys. The second the, the poor play date picks up that truck, right? Uh -oh. the, the truck mm -hmm. and our minds still work that way. So the second you tell yourself, okay, I'm not going to eat any more ice cream. That's, that's what you want. That's now, all you want. Let's be real. I'm not saying you can eat ice cream every darn day and, <laughs> and achieve your goals, but that's not the approach, right? So restrictive mindset is agitating. It's um, authoritative. It's disciplinarian. It doesn't make us feel good. And if something doesn't make you feel good, right? If you could just feel that like visceral reaction you get, then it's not right. Right. Yes. I love all of this so much. Um, what, I, I mean, how did you come about this practice? I don't imagine 10 year old Adrian was like, you know what I want to do? <laughs> I mean, what, what brought this? Cause I've never heard, I've met many types of doctors, whether they're nutritionists or functional medicines, but I've never seen a marriage like this that you've created? What, what kind of inspired this work? You know, I can't say that I went into this field of medicine with this intention in mind. I really, you know, like whether you believe in like the universe or God or the, like whatever you believe in, like, I feel like it was the path that led me here. I had to be here, but no, I did not want to be that. I didn't even know that that existed. And even when I was in residency, I described it. I describe it. I mean, I had applied and I had gotten accepted to a highly specialized procedure, doctory uh, specialty. And I thought being a doctor meant you do stuff to people and fix them, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It was only when things happened and I had to change course and I really started listening to people that this came about. Um, I, you know, I really like my patients were my teachers, you know, and if you listen, um, then you can, you can see where those threads that connect our stories come from. And then of course it correlated because I didn't, I've been doing this work for over 15 years, but I did not you know, day one practicing doctor. And I talk about that too. I was very doctory and like, Right. You know, was not doing this, but it was a combination of being pushed by what I was hearing from my patients and then also really delving into my own um, perfectionism, delving into my own desire to please in my own goal oriented. I can't waste time doing mm -hmm. X, Y and Z. Um, and so it, it came about as a marriage of my own personal journey that I think I'd really describe. Oh, very um, well. Book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the commonality to the people who are in front of me. Yeah. I love that. 
it's kind of like um, that. I'm a former teacher, so my students informed my instruction more than any principal or any textbook that was seeing what they learned and how they process the information. It must be the same for you. And I, I there's a lot in a lot of the chapters where you have a client that comes religiously for four weeks and then they don't feel like they're losing enough weight and then they disappear, but they all seem to come back to you. That was something else. What do you think that block is for some of your patients or clients? What do we call the patients, clients? Yeah, I mean, I used to call them patients and then it occurred to me that that's not the right word and clients, I don't know, just people. People. <laughs> just all people. People you work with. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what a, what a big block is for a lot of us. Um, I think we think that our goals are a straight line. Mm. Whether it's, you know, weight loss or it's writing a book or whatever the goal is, we think that, you know, every day, if we put in the effort and we're perfect enough, then we'll get that shiny star and that result, you know, every day and that there won't be any slip ups. And if there are, then we failed, we're off the wagon. Mm. Uh, we, right. As opposed to just, let's get it clear from the beginning. You're going to be off the wagon. Okay. <laughs> just accept it. <laughs> just accept it. Let's get it from the beginning that there will be setbacks, slip ups, you know, disappointments, imperfection, like to be imperfect. And I say this in the book, to be human is to be imperfect. Mm -hmm. But that expectation that I should lose two pounds or four pounds every single darn week, and it will never change. And vacations, will, you know, I will be Teflon and do the same thing on vacation. And there will never be regain or disappoint. I mean, that's false, right? Yeah. And the problem with that expectation is the moment it happens, it throws people into a tailspin, right? The moment you sit down to write that book and you're not feeling inspired or you read the draft from the day before and it's a shitty first draft, it throws you in a tailspin and you crumple up the paper and toss it in the wastebasket. Whereas if, if we all started with this knowing that yes, sister, you're gonna be in a tailspin, then when it happens, instead of like getting mad at ourselves and judging ourselves and disparaging ourselves, we can say, oh, like Adrian, I get it. This is tough. Yes, yeah. you screwed up, but you're human, right? Like, what would you tell your child, right? If your child messed up, would you be like, oh yeah, you're such an idiot, you messed up. Mm -hmm. Like, my love, this is normal. It's human that you're not going to get it every single time, right? And if we had that same level of compassion for ourselves, we could tolerate our imperfections and then get up, dust ourselves off, and then move on. Because what is it that gets in the way of the process? It's not the fact that you went to Palm Springs for the weekend and ate and drank and gained five pounds. That five pounds or 10 pounds or whatever it is, it's irrelevant. It's the fact that you can't come home and get over it. Yeah. It's what happens in the moment after, right? You're at a fork. You can either beat yourself up or you can move on. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple of weeks or maybe even a month, maybe it'll take you a month. You'll lose that five or 10 pounds that you regained. So what, what is a month in your lifetime? Right. right? And then you lose the fact that you had a great time in Palm Springs because you're so worried about all the chips and salsa you ate or whatever the case may exactly. be. Exactly. So, so accept it from the beginning, give yourself kindness in the moment. And, and then, you know, that's also like, let me just say this too, because I think when people hear self-compassion and self-kindness, I mean, even I get like this, like ooey gooey, like, you know, it sounds a little bit too ooey gooey for me. But even if you're goal oriented and you really want to get the job done, the science shows that if you can meet yourself with self-acceptance, then you're going to get the job done much more likely than you don't for this very reason. Because if you can be self-accepting, then you won't sabotage yourself by, by staying off the wagon. Right, right. Oh, it's so, I love everything you're saying. I, I definitely feel like, and, and maybe this is more with women and when we get together, but we all get together for dinner and everyone says, Oh, 
I can't eat that. I can't have this. Let's get fries for the table. Why don't you just get the fries? You know? <laughs> it's like, I feel like it's embedded in our language. And I don't know where that comes from, but because I can remember growing up, my mom always being on a diet, always compl- commenting on what she was eating. And, and then as when I had my daughter, I was like, don't talk about what she's eating. Don't talk, don't talk, don't make a comment. But I had to like reprogram myself to this kind of language we have around. Yes, but then here's the other piece to it, right? Because I also want to be realistic and actionable, okay? Because maybe somebody who's listening is like, okay, but please reconcile fries with healthy weight, right? And the truth is, if you're going out to dinner, then 100% eat the fries, enjoy it. I have fries, you know, my husband and I have date night once a week. I love like Hillstone's burger and fries. Oh yeah. And a glass of, I love that. And a glass of Cabernet. Mm-hmm. I do. Love it. Right. But then during the week I make time. Like I even, I have my salad here. Carrie. I mean, I make oh. time to like make my lunch and bring it to work. Right. Um, I make time to nourish myself properly. I try not to do mindless snacking. Right. Because it's not the fries, enjoy the fries. But then when you're in the office and you're walking past so-and-so's desk and there's M&Ms there and we get triggered because visual cues are triggering, right? Mm -hmm. If you can say in that moment, you know what? I I wasn't even thinking M&Ms. This is my environment giving me this cue. Or even be aware of it, right? Like how many times, for example, you have kids How many times did you clean off your children's plate? Not even knowing, like, oh, and dialing in. Not all the time. You're not even, you're not dialed in. You don't even, like, you look down and you're like, oh my God, who finished that plate of cold fries? Don't eat the cold fries. (laughs) You're not the garbage can. So, yes, if we can, and even that is an act of mindfulness, even that is an act of self kindness that, like, yeah, if the food is garbage, then it goes in the trash. This whole thing of like not wasting food and then wasting ourselves eating cold, gross food. How is that respecting yourself and your body? Right? So true. So I can't tell you when my son was small, you have your little grilled cheese and quesadilla cut up. Oh, you're not going to finish that? Let me finish it for you. Like I would have never made one for myself, but because it was there, you just eat it uh, mindlessly. Mindlessly. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. Wow. This is really, really, really great. I want to know um, when, when, what would you recommend someone who's reading the book and is kind of like, okay, I'm having my aha moment. What would be their next steps after the book? What, what's going on next for them? Can, do you only work with people in person? Do you work virtually as well? So I, so I work with people uh, in, in person and virtually through the like medical setting. I don't do coaching and stuff because of my life, my medical license is separate. Um, I really would, but I, for somebody who does, who wants to come in, yes, or do a virtual, yes, I'm accessible to anyone. But I really would recommend people to work with the journaling prompts. Mm-hmm. Um, I would recommend, I have a, my own podcast called Health Bite, where I dig into a lot of these chapters in detail, talking about hungry for boundaries. Talk, I mean, my podcast last week was about phone consumption. And the title was Phone Consumption is Nutrition Too, right? Like yeah. what you put in front of your mind and you consume mentally, right? How often does that scrolling the social media or the news in front of you prompt you to agitation and then the next thing you know you're eating something right yes so so the podcast will revisit a lot of these things health fight um and jo- joining the newsletter too um to stay connected that way i i have all these resources because clearly i'm very passionate about this work yes. and so i try and put it out there in different mediums i love it. and your passion comes through in the book but also now Um, so how do we find, how do we get to your newsletter? What's our website we're going to? Yeah. So dradrianudeem.com. If you go to dradrianudeem.com, the newsletter, the book, the journaling guide, the health bite podcast all lives there. I also, my social media of choice is Instagram. I put daily my own posts, um, you know, my own shenanigans and musings come out in quotes and 
what have you. I, I love it. I follow you on Instagram and I follow the book. <laughs> so yeah. So Dr. Adrian it. Udeem on Instagram is another place. I love that. Now, any, before we get carried away, any final thoughts, words you want to share with anyone listening who might really be struggling? Yeah. Um, be kind to yourself, right? Be kind. And I think that analogy of the child is a great way of of thinking about it. Like if you wouldn't say it to your child, then don't say it to yourself. And the second thing would be carve out some time for awareness, right? Carve out some time to just be because we don't have to be running and doing. And it's only through slowing down and being that we can really get to the root of, of what is, you know, angsting us and, and also the root of how to get to that more fulfilled life. Because at the end of the day, like, what's the point, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, we just want to live well, right? Yes. So yes. we have to make time for that. I love this. This is all wonder, wonderful, wonderful advice. And we're going to put all of this in the show notes. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, just it's right below. <laughs> you can see it right below. Um, okay. So before we wrap up, we got to get carried away. Let's um, do it. First, what during the pandemic kept you and the family busy, preoccupied? What did you guys get obsessed over? I know a lot of people were baking. Some people were creating uh, content for TikTok. What were you guys up to? I, I refuse to get on TikTok. Let me just me say too. That. I refuse. <laughs> um, well, my husband, who's a surgeon, who really, I, I never stopped working because I just transitioned to Zoom. My husband, who's a surgeon, who couldn't literally get in the operating room started baking sourdough bread. And I, and I describe <laughs> how the combination of his sourdough bread and red wine was the first time that I gained weight in over 20 years. So I, <laughs> 10 pounds attributable to that. But we started a tradition of hopping into the pool after the quote work day. You know, when I was done with Zoom and he was done with his baking and the kids were done with their schooling, um, that was our family time. Oh, I love that. That's so great. That's really special. And it's kind of like one of those happy things that came out as a result. Could you, would you have done it if we weren't in a pandemic and quarantine? I mean, at five o'clock or five 30, would I be in the pool or in the jacuzzi? No, no, no. I love that. I love that. Um, And then of course, my last question is always, what's something that you can't stand that people get completely carried away about? Um, for example, I never watched one episode of Grey's Anatomy, never watched it. Couldn't get it. I was like, nope, but people were obsessed about this show. Game of Thrones too. I was like, nah, I can't do it. What about you? <laughs> uh, there's so many directions again, and like so many things I could say, but I think the thing that first came to mind, the, the thing that I really hate with a vengeance is detox slash cleanse. Oh. That whole thing, detox, like you need to take this supplement to detox yourself, right? Or follow this diet to detox yourself. I'm going to give you guys a tip. We all have livers. God <laughs> gave us a liver. The liver will detox our bodies, right? You don't need to pay for that <laughs> supplement or that diet because your liver is doing it for you. So that would be my, that would be my thing. I love, love it. And you did mention um, a nutritional bar or supplements that you work with. Tell me a little bit before we wrap up about those. Yes, yes. So, you know, in my practice and in the podcast, everything, I talk about compassionate, which we talked a lot about, but I also talk about actionable because at the end of the day, we need tools. And one of the tools that I think is very important is healthy snacks on the go, right? Like you need something that is satiating, clean, and yeah. yet not super caloric. So it kills the bank. It didn't exist. So I created Del Bar, which is a line of high protein, low calorie nutritional bars made from functional ingredients like turmeric, ashwagandha, all this good stuff. Yeah. And um, my patients love it. My kids love it. I love it. And um, right now, actually, we're doing a a promo that if you go onto the website, we're offering the, our best uh, selling flavors, just because I'm so convinced that people will love it, that, that I want you to try it on, on me. So I would love that. 
That's oh. their website too. Okay, wonderful. And that's on your website as well. We can get linked to that. Yes, yes. And it's Dr. Adrian Udeem. And if you want to put it in there, Dell Nutrition, D-E-H-L Nutrition, one word is the link to the website. And can I just tell you that the word Dell, so I was born here, as I said, but my parents are from Iran. The word Dell has two meanings. It means stomach. So very kind of concrete, literal meaning. Sure. But it also has this spiritual quality of heart and soul. Oh. And so I chose that because when we feed ourselves, when we nourish ourselves, we're not just feeding our bodies, but we are feeding our mind, our heart and our soul. Right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's we're all interconnected. It's all one working machine. Why we can't just fix like a car. We can't just fix the brakes. The engine has to run. The, the everything has to work and for it to run smoothly and safely. Right. And happily. <laughs> and happily. That's right. Uh, with joy and love and compassion. I love this. Um, finding just reconnecting with yourself through this book was really eye-opening for me. I, like I said, you know, because I had just gone through surgery, the timing of this couldn't have been better. So I don't know what brought us together, but I'm glad that we finally got connected. Um, so thank you to Heather. <laughs> She's yes. listening. I'm uh, glad too, Carrie. Yeah. So thank you so much for being my guest. Again, everything is in the show notes um, of how I'm going to actually go to the website now and order those bars because I am notorious for waiting too long and then like I, 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 eating all the the fast things that I don't need anymore. So I'm headed there now. Thank you so much for being my guest and getting carried away. It was awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you.